on this Thursday night, a view from inside Gaza. The health crisis and total despair. We hear from Doctors Without Borders. There's nothing you can do. And inside Hebron, a West Bank city where thousands of Palestinians live under Israeli rule. If there's an emergency, what do you do? Nothing. Die. Ontario revamps the rules on alcohol sales. What's in store, when, and the trouble critics fear. Pinpointing the cause of severe morning sickness. I've never been in such a weak physical state before. How it's raising hopes of a possible cure. And no assembly required. IKEA's answer to those who are tired of Turkey. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Israel's government is showing no willingness to change its strategy in Gaza despite the human suffering and the international pressure. Israel's defense minister said today the fighting will last more than several months and the prime minister vowing it will continue until absolute victory. The American president Joe Biden has sent his national security advisor back to the region. He says he's pressing Israel to carry out more precise and surgical attacks. The U.N. Agency for Palestinian Refugees calls Gaza a living hell. The health ministry run by Hamas says 18,700 Palestinians have now been killed there. Israel's siege pushed civilians south where they were told they'd be safer. Rafah is as far south as they can get. The UN says the population there is a balloon from 280,000 to well over 1 million people. About half of Gaza's population searching for shelter. The lucky ones find space in overcrowded UN facilities. The rest are squeezed into makeshift camps. Crystal Gamansing has our top story tonight. It's, it's really tough. I mean, if I, if I move the computer to my left now and I show you the street, you will see that the street of the clinic is strewn with tents. So tents are everywhere in Rafah. The eyes of medical teams in Gaza are the eyes of the world. So it's like we are speaking now and then suddenly there is a boom. And after the boom, it's like black smoke. And this is it. I mean, life just vanish here from one split of a second to the next. The need for urgent care is obvious, but people also require help managing chronic conditions, plus all of the issues related to poor nutrition and next to no sanitation. It's manifested into a lot of respiratory infections, a lot of diarrhea, skin diseases. I mean, scabies is not something that will take your life away, but I can assure you it makes it help. Nicholas Papa Chrysostomu is the emergency coordinator for Doctors Without Borders. He says it's not just about what doctors are seeing now, but what could come. There are fears about cholera. We will be building another 20 beds capacity in the parking lot of the hospital. So you see, that's the only way to do this. It's You can't support the existing system. The existing system has been brought to its knees. You need to try and extend it. Out of desperation, aid trucks have been swarmed and looted. There are so many people with so many needs. Even Papa Christostomu struggled to find blankets for the new parking lot clinic. It's, it's incredible how sometimes you feel restricted by the context and there's Nothing you can do. The conflict leaving helpers feeling helpless. Crystal Gavancing, Global News, London. <laughs> This video is causing outrage. An Israeli soldier is reciting a Jewish prayer inside a mosque. It happened in Jenin in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. The Israeli army says the soldiers have been removed from duty and will be disciplined. Benin has been the focus of an Israeli army raid. The military says 60 people have been arrested and hundreds of explosive devices and weapons seized. The Palestinian health ministry says at least 12 people have been killed and dozens of people injured, plus a mosque desecrated.
Israeli military incursions into the West Bank are common. Palestinian officials call this latest one a dangerous escalation and say more than 270 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank since October 7th. An estimated 3.2 million people live in the West Bank, including more than 700,000 Jewish settlers. Their settlements, considered illegal under international law, have grown, as have fences and walls separating them from Palestinian neighbors. The divide is stark in Hebron, a West Bank city split in two, where thousands of Palestinians live under the total control of the Israeli military. Danielle Hamamjun explains what that occupation means. A symbol of Palestinian nationalism, of Palestinian resistance. Since 1961, these machines have been weaving the traditional kefiyeh used as a scarf or a headdress. The last authentic factory in the West Bank has seen a surge in global demand since the conflict began. But trying to sell them in the same city they're made can be a problem. The Israeli military has come by to take them down, says Bedir. His shop is in an area called H2, divided and controlled by the IDF. Hebron is itself a city of symbols. This ancient complex is sacred to both Muslims and Jews. It's also where a Jewish settler massacred 29 Muslim men during prayers in 1994. A few years later, the two sides agreed to divide the city, but peace has always remained fragile. Now, nearly 40,000 Palestinians live in H2, moving mostly through checkpoints. They're surrounded by surveillance cameras and razor wire, separating them from 900 Israeli settlers, considered to be some of the most extreme in the West Bank, according to human rights groups. The Israeli military protects them, First, the closure started in 1994. While simultaneously enforcing a strict lockdown on the Palestinians who live close to the heart of the city. You can't come to my house. I, I, you know, uh, the checkpoint, they close it uh, on the night. Uh, it's only Sunday, Tuesday and uh, Thursday, one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening. We are allowed to pass the checkpoint. No visitors, no ambulances, no kindergartens, no schools, no jobs. If there's an emergency, what do you do? Nothing. Die. In the old city of Hebron, people have stopped coming and merchants have stopped selling. There's no point anymore, they say. If he's lucky, Hisham will sell one or two items a week. They're trying hard to empty the city and they manage and succeed in doing that because a lot of shopkeepers live this area because they can't do living anymore. Keeping the shop open, he says, is a form of resistance. And the reason it's become so unbearable, just look up. There aren't just shops in the old city of Hebron. There are Palestinian families who live here. There's one family behind this door. When they come out, they'll see the garbage right above them and upstairs, Israeli settlers. Palestinians have had to build a fence on top to catch the garbage Israeli settlers throw down at them. In some cases, they live just a few feet apart. Now, here, that, that a Palestinian family, Behind it, have a settler in here named Abraham Avino. So you got Kora. barbed wire just yeah. right there. Like a settler, people stop in a top in a roof, throw eggs, throw rubbish about a family here. I want the world to know that Palestinians are living under apartheid, under discrimination, no life. We, we don't have the basics for our life. No enough water, no enough electricity, no freedom of movement, no uh, freedom of expression. We live less than animals because of the occupation, not because we are not civilized. It's a Tuesday night and Isa has to cross back into H2 through a checkpoint before the curfew kicks in. That strict lockdown has been in place since the conflict began. Now, Global News reached out to a spokesperson for the Israeli settlers, but our request for an interview was denied. Donna. Danielle Hamamjan in Jerusalem tonight, thanks. Four suspected members of Hamas have been arrested in Germany and the Netherlands, accused of plotting to target Jewish sites in Europe.
Prosecutors say the suspects intended to store weapons in Berlin for use in a possible attack. Initial reports suggest the plot was not very advanced. And in Denmark, three people were also arrested on suspicion of terrorism offenses, not directly linked to the German arrests. Counterterrorism officials across Europe have warned the October 7th attacks by Hamas in Israel and Israel's siege on Gaza could increase the risk of terrorism. The European Union has agreed to open membership talks with Ukraine. The president of the European Council calls it a clear signal of hope for the Ukrainian people and the continent. This is extremely important. We want to support Ukraine. It's a very powerful political signal. It's a very, very powerful political uh, decision. Right now, though, progress in the war with Russia has stalled and Western military support for Ukraine is beginning to fade. At the same time, the Russian president's confidence seems to be rising. Eric Sorensen reports. A year ago, when the war was going badly, Vladimir Putin canceled his annual public appearance. Today, he answered questions for four hours, displaying confidence, assuring Russians peace will come. There will be peace when we achieve our goals, said Putin. Along the front, more than 600,000 Russian troops, he said, are improving their positions. The reality is little has changed on the front lines since last winter, through the summer of Ukraine's counteroffensive, and until now, going into winter again, Russia still occupies about one-sixth of Ukraine's territory in the east. Yet Putin has looked relaxed, telling military leaders this week he will run for president again in March. In contrast, Ukraine's president has been shuttling furiously from Washington to Europe to shore up support for his country. Late today, a political victory for Ukraine. The EU will begin talks for Ukraine's membership. There is no reason to negotiate membership of Ukraine now. Hungary's hardline leader Viktor Orban was prepared to block negotiations, but later backed off, paving the way for talks to enlarge the EU. I think it's important that we give a strong message to, uh, to our Ukrainian friends, first on military and financial support, and then on, uh, on enlargement. Still, support from the U.S. remains uncertain, as Republicans in the U.S. Congress have blocked more funding. Zelensky definitely uh, is uh, feeling the pressure to um, increase uh, and, and sustain that flow of, of uh, weapons. This week, Moscow struck Kyiv with more missiles. And with war in the Middle East, Ukraine is struggling to keep global attention on its fight. We're two years in. We're going into the third year. And... Um, you know, there is creeping apathy. That's why the EU's breakthrough on Ukraine membership is so important. Volodymyr Zelensky posted that it's a victory for Ukraine and for Europe, as his country prepares to defend itself through another long winter at war with Russia. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. It's going to get easier to buy alcohol in Ontario. Up to 8,500 convenience and big box stores will be eligible to sell some types of alcohol. Premier Doug Ford promised he'd do this. Mackenzie Gray explains the changes and why mental health and addictions experts are concerned. I'm tempted to go back there, crack up one of those. But... It's a decision many Ontarians have been thirsting for. By no later than January 2026, people in Ontario will be able to buy beer, wine, cider, and other ready-to-drink alcohol beverages like coolers and seltzers at their local convenience store. That ends the near monopoly the beer store has had since Prohibition on the sale of large cases across the province. We're actually uh, treating people like, like adults, and I have all the confidence in the world and the people in Ontario. But mental health and addiction advocates disagree, pointing to alcohol use increasing with young Canadians, leading to higher cancer rates. If we are going to make these shifts, we have to be really, really careful about how we do it. And also we have to be investing at the same time in prevention. Of course they're good kids. A theme the beer store played on in a 2014 ad. Alcohol in convenience stores? It's just not right for our kids. Corner stores like this one here in Gatineau, Quebec, have been selling beer for decades. And we're just a few minutes away from downtown Ottawa, so plenty of people cross the river to come get beer here. But if you're on a budget, there's one place that everyone knows you need to go. The Beer King, a corner store in Elmer, Quebec, is one of the biggest sud sellers in the whole province. A lot of people come from everywhere, like Kingston, Toronto, Ottawa. And when people come from Ontario, they load up. Like this would run us, this is gonna run us like 750 bucks for we're gonna get 20 of these. And it's like that at the beer store, 
1300 is a double hundred. These two students hope the Ontario announcement will increase competition and lead to similar cheap Quebec prices. It'll be convenient, you know, late night, you know, run out of pops and you need a couple, but in terms of pricing, I guess we'll see. The beer store, which is internationally owned, will continue to sell suds across the province and be the place where Ontarians take their empties back. But Donna, for the first time since 1927, they'll have some real competition. Okay, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. Scientists pinpoint the cause of severe morning sickness. Coming up, what this could mean for a cure. It's being called a breakthrough in the quest to uncover what causes some women to feel so sick during pregnancy. So-called morning sickness can last all day and in some cases be so bad that mothers need to be hospitalized. Abigail Beeman explains what scientists have discovered. Willow Allen is an Inuk model, recently featured in Vogue, and she's been sharing her pregnancy on social media. About three months straight, I never got out of bed. Hyperemesis gravidarum, a severe form of nausea and vomiting believed to affect up to three out of a hundred pregnancies. For Allen, it meant constant illness, losing 15 pounds and multiple hospital trips. It was really terrifying. It was, I've never been in such a weak physical state before. And just having such little control over, like, your life. Now, a study published in the journal Nature pinpoints the cause. It's all about a hormone produced by the fetus called GDF-15, how much there is and the mom's sensitivity to it. It really gives us a very clear idea of what we should do to treat and prevent it. Study author Stephen O'Rahilly is working on both. A treatment means creating a safe antibody that won't cross the placenta. A cure, he says, involves desensitizing mothers to GDF-15 and could come sooner. There are ways of giving pretty safe and available drugs that we know increase GDF-15. Metformin is one of those. It actually doubles your level or doubles or even trebles your level of GDF-15. So we, we were going to do a trial soon, we hope. And while the Princess of Wales and actress Amy Schumer have shed more light on the illness, uh, oh. its severity is still not understood. O'Rahilly says in the UK alone, between one and 200 wanted pregnancies are terminated a year. Dreaming of a big family one day, the study means a lot to Willow Allen. It just makes me so emotional because, like, I honestly, sorry, I honestly thought that, like, I might not be able to have kids. She still gets sick, but feels way better now at 34 weeks. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Biases and barriers in health care ahead. Why November Kelly's family feels her death could have been prevented. The parents of an Ontario Indigenous woman who died earlier this year are speaking out for the first time about the care she received. November Kelly died of a severe infection her family says could have been prevented, raising fresh questions about the care Indigenous people receive in Canada's health care system. Melissa Ridgen has been investigating November's story and tonight takes us to Enigaming, First Nation, five hours west of Thunder Bay. Very beautiful. And her life was just ahead of, like, so much. A year after losing their daughter, Ron and Carrie Kelly are still holding on to her. I have her sock. I keep her sock from this is the day she came home. Her name was November. They raised her to become a leader in her community. She was a partner and a mother of two. She was this beautiful, beautiful, bright, articulate young woman. And um, her death is, is a tragedy. There's, there's no other way to put it. Um, we believe it was unnecessary. Witnesses called it a miracle that November Kelly survived this crash in October 2022. A passenger in a car that skidded off a highway into a lake. November got rushed to Thunder Bay. Internal. Internal bleeding, they said. Six days later, she was sent home. But for the next four months, her mother says the pain got worse. She felt like her insides were dying. That's what she'd tell me. I feel like I'm dying on the inside. Multiple visits to doctors in Fort Francis, 100 kilometers south, resulted in little relief. She was prescribed uh, Metamucil. Uh, she was also prescribed, uh, it's called Rabizoli, and it's for, you know, stomach 
you know, if you have ulcers or whatever. Only her final appointment returned a diagnosis, abdominal inflammation. She was sent home with medicine for nausea and pain. The next day, on a family trip to Winnipeg for a Jets game, November was too sick to leave the hotel room. The father of her two children went to check on her. He started messaging me, her partner Brody, can you come? I can't wake up November. There's something wrong with her. I can't get her up. She was rushed to Winnipeg St. Boniface Hospital. After receiving emergency care, a doctor delivered terrible news. She said, okay, well, unfortunately, we were unable to save her. An autopsy revealed November died from a severe infection caused by a hole in her bowel, suffered during the crash four months earlier. The health authority in Fort Francis tells Global News an event review is underway, but November Kelly's family says that sounds disturbingly familiar. For the four months she was suffering with her internal injuries and the doctors <clears throat> didn't um, probe enough to get to the bottom of it. In 2008, Brian Sinclair died in a Winnipeg ER waiting room after he'd been left alone and ignored for 34 hours. An inquest found he died slowly of a bladder infection, rigor mortis setting in by the time staff tried to help him. In 2020, Joyce Eshaquan died in a Quebec hospital after posting a video on social media showing staff taunting her because she was Indigenous. An inquest recommended Quebec, quote, recognize and eliminate systemic racism in health care. Now another family is grieving and wondering if their daughter's death could have been prevented. Our baby would be here if they would have uh, listened to her. I do believe and I feel that it, she was racially profiled. Melissa Ridgen, Global News, Enigma First Nation. Next, thinking big this Christmas, IKEA has an idea for dinner. The holidays are the season of giving, and IKEA might have one of the biggest giveaways this year. It is a bit non-traditional. This giant turkey-sized Swedish meatball serves up to 25 people. You do have to live in the UK to enter the draw for it. 30 of the giant orbs, along with 30 vegan versions, will wow the tables of the lucky winners. No assembly required. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Today is the peak of the Geminid meteor shower, one of the biggest of the year. It's unique because unlike most meteor showers, which are caused by comets, this one originates from an asteroid, so the meteors appear brighter and in different colors. Look out for it, and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.